Good morning, guys. Uh, this is the fifth episode of our, you know, kind of webinar series um, surrounding SEO and other digital marketing topics. Uh, today, we're super fortunate that Sam Nam of 50Fs Digital and Z Ventures was able to join us. And he's going to talk to us about digital marketing, uh, kind of his experiences during his journey in this career path and what led to him uh, being where he is now. Um, just a brief, brief, you know, brief introduction and background story. Uh, I used to work for Sam here, right here in the Philippines when he was working here for a company called Digital Room Incorporated. So we basically ran the marketing uh, department of e-commerce websites that specialized in you know, custom printed products for the U.S. market. Um, at the time, I think he was the director of acquisition marketing. And just correct me if I'm wrong after this, Sam. Um, um, later on, he became the VP and headed uh, that department until he went back to the U.S. and kind of started his own businesses. So uh, I wouldn't want to spoil that part too much. Uh, I want Sam to talk about his, um, you know, his ventures ever since he went back. So yeah, I guess without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce everyone to Sam. Sam, take it away. Okay, great. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, so um, yeah, when Glenn asked me to talk, I, I was uh, a little bit nervous because uh, to be honest, I haven't done a lot of hands-on digital marketing much in the last year and a half. Um, as an entrepreneur, you wear a lot of different hats and uh, I've been lucky to have uh, employees and, and, and agencies that do a really great job in supporting us. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, entrepreneurship in general and what I've learned. Uh, I was an employee and uh, you know I started my own companies and uh, that transition is interesting and I'm sure a lot of people who are tuning in today may be thinking about making that shift and you know this is some advice that I can give you. It's not necessarily um, the end all or be all of anything, but it's, it's my take on uh, my experiences. Um, so here, um, like Glenn said, uh, I, I worked at Digital Room, um, but prior to that, he may not know that I had my own e-commerce startup uh, like 2006, 2008, and uh, it failed. It failed pretty bad. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's actually what led me to uh, go get a job and work at Digital Room, and uh, we grew that business very aggressively over the time I was there, and I was fortunate to be part of that team and that experience. And uh, you know, that gave me the skills that I needed to start my own businesses. I started Enterprise UAS with my partners, uh, selling commercial drones to uh, government and uh, utility agencies and uh, different types of uh, large enterprise organizations. Uh, we also co-founded Inkjets.com, uh, a totally different business selling printer and ink cartridges. And um, I think Glenn introduced me as 50X Digital. Uh, that, that is our uh, staffing agency in the Philippines that we founded and we support several uh, digital companies in the United States uh, with uh, offshore staffing needs. And I've done in my own investments, I've invested in several companies um, and I'm currently in the process of becoming a silent partner in all my businesses and starting a new business in which I'll focus all my time and energy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, I, I've, I'm, I think you may walk out of this with more things of what not to do than what things you should do, but I think that's also just as valuable. So I'm going to start with just my startup failure and talk a little bit about what happened there. Um, so it was between 2007 and 2008, we started an e-commerce website. Uh, with my friend and we we're selling acrylic hotfix rhinestones for apparel and uh, this was when Ed Hardy t-shirts were really popular and if you don't remember what an Ed Hardy t-shirt or if you don't know what that is don't worry you're not missing out on much um, they were these very very blingy t-shirts with rhinestones all over them in different skull patterns or rose patterns and it was really the cool thing for that year and um, every brand was trying to copy that design and they're buying pounds and pounds of rhinestones. And uh, my friend and I had been working in the apparel industry and we said, hey, let's let's create a website, let's do this e-commerce and we'll be B2B apparel supply, it'll be great, right, you know? Uh, and I will tell you in the first few months, we did sell quite a few rhinestones. Um, and 
you know, you know, you know, the funny thing here is uh, the the business doesn't make much sense twelve years later, right? Like, who's going to buy pounds of rhinestones, right? And, and what I will say is, uh, don't build your business on a trend that will fade away, right? And I know that sounds kind of obvious, but if you think about it, it happens a lot. Um, you know, you see people, uh, you see people latching onto new trends. You know, suddenly everyone's selling banana bread from their house and and, and uh, everyone's doing Airbnbs or everyone's doing a, you know, show my stall or whatever. You know, trends come every single year and then trends kind of fade away. Some businesses will stay from that trend, but, you know, 90, 90, 95, 99 percent of them, a lot of times they just don't stay because the popularity isn't going uh, isn't to be maintained at that same level. And I, as a young entrepreneur, I didn't really get that. Um, I just thought that trees grew to the sky and uh, this newfound uh, success that we had would last forever. Um, during that experience, you know, uh, I didn't know anything about e-commerce. I was very new. I just graduated from college. I was very tech savvy and I had been working on websites most of my life. And so, you know, I was able to build a website on OS Commerce. We built it on Zencart, then we re rebuilt it on OS Commerce. If you're not familiar with these, these are like old school open source shopping cart systems like 10 years ago before Shopify, right? There was no Shopify back then. Um, and I had to teach myself everything, SEO, SEM, email, you know, I, I was literally packing the boxes and uh, shipping them out myself to customers, uh, answering customer service emails, you know, everything that goes into an e-commerce website. I was just an online seller, just like a lot of people are. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I'll be honest, I, I never made a shirt. Like in the entire time I did that, I, I, I never I never was in a factory making these shirts. Um, I never designed any of these shirts. I had no idea where the industry was going and I was kind of blindsided because um, I, I didn't understand the industry. I had zero experience in e-commerce. I had zero experience in uh, apparel, apparel manufacturing. And uh, I, th I see a lot of people thinking that they can go to some sort of online course or uh, you know, do some sort of two-week online thing, or they could follow some sort of a uh, guru, and they're going to go into an industry that they know nothing about, and they're just going to be wildly successful. And um, you know, I think I'm here to burst your bubble there a little bit and say, hey, that's really unlikely. You know, if you have no industry industry experience, like if you don't know anything about the industry you're going into, uh, and you don't know anything about the business model you're going into, you got to rethink that. That's not necessarily going to be the best decision. I wish somebody had told me these things before I wasted, you know, uh, all the money that I had and ended up totally broke uh, after this first business venture, you know. But, um, you know, when I graduated in 2007, uh, it was a global financial crisis and nobody was really hiring. I'm sure that sounds familiar to any of any of the younger people out there who watch this and, and think like, hey, it's 2020 and nobody's hiring. Everything's closed because of COVID-19, right? Um, I started the business out of desperation, uh, and I came out even more broke than I went into it. Um, but I don't think I would ever take it back because I learned three valuable lessons from this. First, from this experience, I, I understood that I wanted to work at an internet company, uh, even though what, what happened to us sucked and what the results did, weren't very good. I really enjoyed building the website. I enjoyed learning about digital marketing and SEO and all that. And, um, I came out of that realizing I didn't know a lot, right? You know, they have they talk about this Dunning Kruger effect, where where you first go and you think you know everything, and then you go into this valley of despair as your knowledge grows because you feel like you don't know anything. And I, I came out of this business right in that valley where I was like, I don't know anything, and I need somebody to teach me. And I think that uh, attitude to come into something and, and and admit that I needed somebody to teach me was really valuable in my next step. And third was uh, money is making money is not easy, you know. Um, and I think a lot of people are smart enough to know that, but I wasn't. I really felt like I was such a sharp cookie, and I was going to come out of college, and you know, I had the Midas touch. Whatever I touched would turn to gold, and uh, I, I, I fell flat on my face. Um, but even that, you know, the failure was valuable. So I, I don't know if you guys are there, if anyone's feeling that way. Um, I don't know who needs to hear this, but even failures are valuable. So don't give up, you know, and try to take away. Uh, what you can learn from that from that experience. So that kind of sets the stage. You know, a lot of people will introduce me and be like, Sam's done this, 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 and this, and all this, you know, but I like to start kind of where it all started, which was with my first failure. And uh, I came into Digital Room. Um, when Glenn met me, uh, you know, I was the director of marketing. Um, but that's not actually how I started there. Um, 
I started looking for a company on uh, a job online and I applied to all the big name companies, the well-funded startups in Silicon Valley. I didn't even get a single interview. Nobody called back. Uh, nobody replied at all. You know, I didn't have any work experience to speak of and I didn't come from a top tier college and it was unlikely that they're going to call me. You know, now in hindsight, I knew that. Um, but I mean I, I mean, I know that, but then I didn't know that. And um, even when I interviewed at Digital Room, I didn't get that job. Uh, they actually hired someone else, Joy Go, uh, who Glenn and I both know, and uh, you know she may see this someday. But uh, she actually got the job that I applied for. <laughs> but uh, I kept calling back. I actually tricked the receptionist to give me the director of marketing cell phone. I said, "Hey, you know, he told me that he's going to call me, and he didn't call me, so I would like his cell phone number." <laughs> so they gave it to me. I called him. I somehow ended up getting a meeting with the CEO and talked him to giving me a totally different job within the department um, as a marketing assistant, you know? And I will tell you sometimes when you're trying to get started, you know, whether it's starting your business, getting your first customer, or getting a job where you could get some experience and learn how, how to uh, navigate uh, uh, the different skills and stuff, you need to have grit. Um, and that just means don't take no for an answer, don't give up. I <laughs> literally waited two and a half hours in the lobby just to talk to this guy. Uh, and you know, I, I would be, I was, I, I remember thinking I'll be damned if I, I leave here without something, you know, um, cause I had waited two and a half hours in a suit downstairs in the lobby. And, uh, you know, I, I talked him into it. Uh, he still says it was the best decision he ever made. So I feel, I, I feel like we're both a little bit lucky that that happened. Um, when you start your business, you know, the, there's a couple of things that are, are really common themes when I talk to startup founders. Um, one is obviously my, my business is not, is, is, is not growing, uh, and, and that's a challenge. And, and we could talk about that later towards the end on the Q and a side, I'm going to talk a little bit more about technical aspects of growth, uh, and I'll, I'll take your guys' questions. Um, but the other is recruitment, finding talent, right? Especially when you're a small company, um, you don't necessarily have all the resources or the nicest offices, uh, you know. GDI didn't always have such a nice office in Pampanga. I remember uh, uh, we shared an office for a while back in Manila, which was which was fine, but it wasn't necessarily glamorous or anything like that. Um, but you know, the best recruitment tool that you can have that nobody else can have is growth, right? Growth creates opportunity to promote from within, and nothing attracts people more than the opportunity to grow. And everyone's probably nodding their heads when they hear this because they're like, "Yeah, I want to go to somewhere I could get grow growth," and uh, nothing is more tangible uh, when, than when you go into a company and a bunch of people have been there and they've just been promoted and, and you're replacing uh, their job, right? And they're training you to do their old job and they're telling you like, hey, I, I used to do this and now I've been promoted. And that creates a, a level of excitement, you know? Um, so even if you gamify this a little bit, and uh, I think I have some former employees and current employees on here. Let me just check who's here. <laughs> um, so even if you gamify this a little bit, uh, you know, at Digital Rooms, some of my employees may remember we had multiple tiers. Uh, there, you know, you would start as a junior, level one, level two, you know, go into a, a specialist and a senior specialist, and there are just multiple, multiple levels. And, and the reality is as people progress within their career, uh, they get salary increases, but for some reason, a lot of companies don't have the appropriate tiers of uh, title changes to kind of uh, honor that growth. And, you know, we would really make sure that people were almost, uh, if they did their job and they did a good job, every one or two years, they would get a meaningful salary increase and they would get uh, a promotion title and change in responsibility, right? No one wants to be doing the same thing for five years, you know, straight. You want to see a little bit of a change in your workload. You want to see a little more responsibility. You want to see a little bit more money, right? So when you're growing your company, think about that as part of your strategy. You know, you, growth is your best recruitment tool. Um, and, you know, once you figure out the marketing piece and you get growth, make sure you try to hang on to your people and you promote them from within, even if they're not necessarily ready for the position. You know, as a founder, your job is to help them get them there and help them grow into those shoes. Um, and that sounds a little counterintuitive. You know, some people might say, um, no, they have to show me that they earned it. I'm like, kind of both ways, right? Kind of both ways. You also have to show them that you're willing to invest in them so that, you know, they'll stick with you and your company as well. Um, and, and, and so this is really about Digital Room. We were on a rocket ship. We went from eight 
million to 80 million while I was there. And I think today it's over $200 million in revenue, right? Uh, and that's meaningful growth uh, in just 15 years um, to, to get to that size, especially as a B2B e-commerce company and not as a software company. And so I'm kind of going back and thinking about um, what made that successful. You know, one was definitely the growth attracted the people. And two was people there really wanted to come to work and be with their coworkers. I can't even keep track of how many lifelong friends and even marriages came out of that group. You know, lots of people say like, you're not supposed to make friends at work or don't get too social with people. You're just there to work. Um, you know, maybe that's true for other people, but for me, I, I just don't, I just don't agree with that. Uh, for my, for me and the culture that I want to build. And I think what has led to success in the companies that I've led, uh, is that, you know, when people are friends, they'll work tirelessly to solve complex problems, you know, things that seem insurmountable, they will get each other's back and back each, each other up, you know? Um, so think about how you want to create that type of environment. You know, sometimes that might mean, uh, leaning heavily on your referral program, right? So that friends are literally recruiting friends, you know, so that starts some early bonds. Um, I think a third of the people that we hired in the first six months that I was there all graduated from the same college at the same time, you know? That's an example of like, hey, you know, it's good to recruit out of a batch of people that know each other because together they're going to be stronger than they would be individually, you know? Um, especially, I think, in Filipino culture, uh, when you hire somebody and they don't know anybody in the office, it's, they feel more, more timid to share. Maybe they don't get as engaged as quickly. But if you bring in a group of people that kind of know each other, I find that they encourage each other and, and they help each other out, you know. And so uh, without you knowing, they're coaching each other and getting things done, you know. And I think that that was really valuable to me um, and my team. Uh, we grew the team there, you know, and Glenn was a part of that team. Carla was a part of that team uh, to uh, I don't know, 45, 50 people at, for in, the, in the marketing department at some point, you know, and um, everybody was pretty young. Nobody had more than, you know, four or five years of a digital marketing experience. And we were growing a multi, you know, plus 100, 100 million plus brand. Uh, and, and that was pretty exciting. So I left Digital Room. Um, a lot of people ask me why I left Digital Room. I think as time goes by, I, I kind of understand that a little bit more. Uh, and, you know, my answer kind of changes as that, as that, as that um, as that understanding evolves. But at a high level, I would say that uh, the company grew very fast and it got to a phase where um, it was a big company. You know, it felt like a big company to me. And uh, I, I, I wanted to go back to kind of that exciting feeling of hiring these new people and building a team. Uh, and I kind of wanted to do more than just marketing. Um, so when I came out, uh, I was so excited to try so many different things. My partner, I partnered with a partner um, you know, who is a good friend and a, and a good mentor to me. And, uh, you know, we, we founded two companies at the same time, you know, um, we founded Enterprise UAS. Uh, like I said, we sold commercial drones. And when I say drones, I mean drones flying, uh, flying uh, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, that, uh, you know, serve different commercial purposes for law enforcement, search and rescue, uh, inspecting buildings and, and bridges and, and cell towers and that kind of stuff. And then on the other side, we had inkjets.com, which was sell, selling printer cartridges um, online. Um, very simple business, um, but very, very, very successful at the same time. And then and, and again, 50X Digital, the Philippines company that we had. I kind of call this co-co-co-founder because uh, I basically co-founded three companies around the same period of time. And the lesson from that is don't do that. <laughs> uh, focus your energy and time into you know, your most worthwhile investment. Don't start three companies and divide your focus. You can only really delegate so much. You know? um, and I, I'm sure some of you guys will say you're wrong. You know, I have 10 successful companies. Um, you know, I, I'm Elon Musk or you know, I'm Glenn D. Mandel. You know, Glenn's a pretty smart guy. I see him doing a lot of things and I think he's, he's doing that gracefully, which I admire. Um, but for me, it just didn't work. Uh, it's not that any of my businesses failed. Actually, all the businesses did well. All the businesses are surviving even through COVID and, you know, are profitable. And a lot of people would say, hey, you did a great job with these. Why are you saying, you know, you wouldn't have done them all? Well, the reality is uh, one of them really pays most of the bills. And if I had focused all my time on that, it probably would have been uh, two times as big and eclipsed the revenue and profitability of all the other two companies, realistically. Uh, so, you know, when I think about that, I ask myself, why did I do that? 
and it, it's the whole coco co co founder right you know this hashtag serial entrepreneur lifestyle right you think you're hustling and you're doing all these exciting things and if you talk to me two to three years ago i thought I, I was doing it all right you know like um, diversifying my portfolio but um i think that was a mistake i think it, 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 it wreaked havoc on my personal life it gave me a lot of stress um, I was constantly putting out fires. One business had a problem. We had to solve that for two months. And then as soon as that was fixed, there was two more problems. You know, it was like playing whack-a-mole. Um, try not to do that, you know. And, and, and I know some people are trying to start their businesses while they're working at a company. You know, really, uh, you have to be careful about those things because you might actually have a great idea and you may not be able to give it enough intention. And so you may give up on it sooner than you need to um, to succeed because you're splitting your time. You know, anytime you split your time, uh, you're only doing a half-ass job, really. So, um, like I said, all the businesses are 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 doing okay, and we're surviving. And um, you know, I have to say that we owe that a lot to my business partner, who is a little bit older than me, a little bit more conservative. And uh, he always believed in staying lean, keeping the cost as low as possible. You know, sometimes to my annoyance, um, but he always wanted the company to stay lean. He we stayed stocked up. An example of this is like inkjets.com had, um, you know, three to four months of supply, meaning that we didn't have to order a new shipment from China for three to four months to stay in business. And someone might say, well, like some people would say, hey, you, you know, why would you do that? You know, you should do like low inventory. You don't want to have so much cash, you know, uh, uh, tied up in inventory. And our internal man management said, no, you know, there's a lot of supply chain disruptions happening right now because of the trade war between the China and the US. And on top of that, we get better pricing if we buy in bulk, right? So we're willing to uh, stock that up. Well, guess what? When uh, uh, you know we had trade wars, we had COVID-19, a lot of things that disrupted our supply chain, things were not coming out of China at all for you know a month and a half. And uh, people are literally, our competitors were literally going out of stock. And so our sales doubled during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and continue to be at, at a 2x high because of that, you know. In addition to that, we all save a lot of cash. You know, we would save a meaningful amount of cash where we could pay all of our expenses for six months, um, you know, I'll pay all of our employees and, you know, don't have to lay anybody off, right? So um, one thing I, I, I highly recommend for anybody who's starting their own business is to learn to do your own bookkeeping, you know. Uh, I see a lot of people trusting a third-party accountant. An accountant will balance your books. They will tell you how much you're spending at a high level, but they're not going to keep their eye and see if there's a frivolous expense or, or, or if there's a sudden spike in, you know, a small thing, right? It can be as simple as, hey, you know, we have a snack budget in the office and, it, you know, it was 10,000 pesos a month and, and suddenly it's 25,000 pesos a month, you know? Uh, what, what happened there? You know, what's going on with that, you know? And it's really important because that 15,000 might be saved in the bank you know, to be able to pay someone's salary um, in a tough time like COVID-19, right? Um, I think it's a common misconception that people think that, you know, if you're successful, you're just so smart, you have all the right ideas. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, you make you make more right decisions than, than wrong decisions. And uh, that may be true for some really smart people, um, but, uh, for an average guy like me, that's really not the case. You know, uh, I would say that our success uh, in 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 the, f the past four companies and hopefully this uh, next fifth company, um, you know, came from the fact that we kept our eyes on metrics. Uh, like we, I, I I did my own bookkeeping. I, I I checked all the chart of accounts. You know, I looked at my Google Analytics. I looked at my Shopify accounts. I looked at my Magento accounts. I kept my eye on everything. And what that allows you to do is if you make a bad decision, you need to walk that decision back quickly. You know, you need to undo that decision immediately. Um, a lot of people have this thing where they fall in love with an idea, fall in love, you know, in poker, they call it falling in love with your hand. Like the hand clearly lost already, but is, is pocket aces and you just can't fold it because you're just like, I'll never get a hand this great. Well, guess what? That hand isn't good in this situation, right? You need to be able to walk that decision back, undo it as quickly as possible. And on the other side, if you keep your eyes on the metrics, if you have a good idea, then you need to double down on that idea. You need to triple down. You need to scale that idea. You need to, you know, get everybody in the company thinking about that idea. You know, um, people will talk about uh, different marketing channels. And if I'm really, really honest, you know, uh, Digital Room, we really grew on SEO for three years that I was there, three, four years, and then another four years we added on SEM. So SEO and SEM were really, really good. 
because we figured out how to do that correctly and, and, and we put 50 people behind it. But we had like two people doing email marketing and our email marketing program was never very good, you know, um, and it is probably my fault because I just didn't spend much time on it. But I, I, I think about it and I don't think I take that back. You know, if you have a good idea and it's working, keep scaling, keep investing in it, that's going to create rapid growth. Um, at inkjets.com, you know, it, it, it was all about email marketing and SEM. You know, we had good SEO, but it wasn't really what uh, uh, moved the needle as much, you know. Um, surprisingly, uh, at Enterprise UAS, where we sold drones, you know, it wasn't digital marketing that moved the needle. It was events. Uh, it was events. And uh, I guess the digital side of that was content, doing a lot of YouTube videos and tutorials and stuff. And that's what really drove the business and helped us um you know, do that demand generation for the sales team, right? Um, so all my businesses, if you looked and 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 looked at like audited, like a, if an agency ever came in and audited our our marketing, they would tell us, "You're not doing this. You're not doing that. You're not doing that." Yeah, I know, I'm not doing those things. I actually, as a startup or as a as a founder, you don't have enough time to do everything. It's actually a mistake to try to do and everything because you'll do everything poorly. Realistically, what you want to do is you want to test everything. But as soon as you find things that are working really well, you want to try to double, triple, quadruple down on those things as much and try to scale those things up, uh, even if it takes all your time and attention, in my opinion. And like I said at the beginning of this, you know, I'm not the end all be all expert or anything. I am just a guy that, uh, you know, has had some success and Glenn thought that my ideas were worthy of sharing. So uh, I decided to put them on paper like this. Um, and I, you know, I invested in a, a real estate SaaS startup about two years ago. Uh, two, three years ago, I, I, I invested a meaningful amount of my life savings. Um, I really believed in the founder, who was a good friend of mine. He was, he's a brilliant guy. I still think he's a brilliant guy. I believed in the technology. I believed in the solution. Um, you know, everything just seemed right. You know, I, I liked the co-investors that were investing. You know, we had a couple of really big names investing with us, and I thought that this was going to I honestly thought this was going to uh, be my biggest success as a silent investor in this. Um, but what I learned from that is sometimes you fail. That business closed this year and I lost all my money in that. Uh, and it was probably, you know, 25% of my net worth that I lost on a, on a single company. Um, and that hurt. But uh, the lesson you have to learn sometimes is that you could have amazing investors. You could have smart people. You could have a great idea. Everything could seem right, but sometimes you fail, you know. Uh, sometimes you fail. In this case, you know, there were a lot of small things that added up that were a little bit un unexpected. Uh, there was other companies that suddenly came out of nowhere that we hadn't been keeping track of that, uh, you know, had been working in stealth and had had more advanced technology. Uh, we had a couple setbacks uh, in our coding architecture where we had to walk back our code four or five versions to recode. And, you know, a lot of different things happened, you know, all things that were just like reasonable mistakes that happened to every company, but some, you know, bad series of luck, you know, you could, uh, uh, you could flip a coin a uh, hundred times and, and, and somehow end with 70% of the time being tails. It just happens as a standard deviation. Right. Um, and I don't really blame the founder or the CEO, my friend or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I think, important for people to know that because if you don't recognize that that happened um then your first failure might become you know your only failure you might never like or your last try rather you know and you might give up right and i am um, you know that 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 would be sad right so for anyone anyone who's starting a business you know i think I, these are kind of my thoughts but even if you fail try again um it doesn't necessarily mean that you suck it just means that sometimes you fail and and that's okay so that's that's all I prepared today. Um, you know, Glenn, I thought uh, this was a little bit of a different format, and I wanted to talk to you about a little bit more things. But um, I'll, I'll be happy to take some Q and A. All right. So uh, I guess before we proceed to Q and A, um, I just wanted to you know invite everyone to kind of um, you know if you want to talk uh, to Sam and uh, use your voice to ask and uh, just. Uh, type something in the chat box and say me cap with capital letters. Uh, we will acknowledge you and we'll let you, you know, speak to our guest today. But if not, um, if you're like typical Filipino shy and you just want to, you know, type your questions there, that's fine. Uh, John from my team is going to read the question. So, yeah, I, I think there are more than 40 people right now in this call, which is a good thing. Um, it just shows that a lot of people are interested in 
either doing better business or starting a business down the line. And, um, you know, given the pandemic and everything that's going on right now, might be the best time to kind of reflect on your career. And if you've ever had any aspira aspirations of being an entrepreneur, uh, now might be the best time, believe it or not, to kind of explore that idea. So, yeah. Um, John, do we have any questions so far? If not, um, I'm going to start asking Sam. Well, Benj uh -huh. has a question. Benj had a question if uh, I wore the T-shirts. And uh, that's even the worst part of it. I didn't even like the style of that clothing. <laughs> That's how far apart I was from my customers or their and you know, B2B C B2B to C. I had no idea what I was doing in that business. So uh, thank you for that question, Benj. Um, I guess a follow-up to that would be do you think you have to like what you're selling in order to be successful at it? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think you have to like it, but I think if you don't like it, you need to have additional discipline to really be uh, using data and researching it quite a bit, right? There, I know some marketers that you know are men who sell to teenage fashion brands, you know, and uh, it, you know they they don't have a personal interest in that. Hopefully not, um, but you know they're good at it because they do all their research and all that. So um, I, I think that would be my question. I uh, that would be my answer to that question. All right. So one of my friends over here, uh, Kurt Molina, has a question and he'd like to talk. So, Kurt? All right. Hi, good morning, Sam. Hi. All right. Uh, I just have a question, though. Um, since, by the way, uh, I'm Kurt and I'm one of men, um, some person who is mentored by Sir Glenn on SEO. And I plan on starting my own SEO agency, hopefully uh, within this year, or if not, next year. Um, I have started some things um, or, or have prepared um, and able to start my a SEO ag agency. But then uh, I think I have a hard time motivating myself to continue pursuing it, or I mean, to keep pushing through to make it uh, go into reality. So what would be your uh, suggestions or sometimes uh, based on your experiences also on how to establish uh, your dream business? Sure. What, what do you find is, um, like when you say that you're having a hard time getting started, uh, describe that to me a little bit more. You know, or is, is it that uh, you don't feel confident to launch or is it that you are unproductive during the day? I guess I'm, I'm unproductive during the day because uh, I already have um, talked to people who are possible partners and who are possible uh, persons who can help me to, uh, I mean, in terms of web development, web design, content writing, and graphics. I already have those teams. But then uh, I just don't have the motivation to, uh, I mean, to keep going or to, keep, uh, to start uh, mm -hmm. immediately. Got it. Got it. Well, I mean, I think there's two ways to approach this problem. Uh, you know, one is to put yourself on some sort of project management software, put some real deadlines. Um, I personally actually write a lot of things on whiteboards and paper because you, you know, in Trello or Asana, you could like literally edit cards and, you know, just kind of trick yourself into changing the, the, the goalpost, if you will, you know, to change the deadline. Oh, I'll just give myself another day, right? So writing stuff down on paper helps for me a lot. Writing stuff down onto whiteboards has a kind of a, uh, physical visceral experience right so you know try to keep yourself accountable that way and push yourself to finish these goals but there might be another problem you know this might be too big to start right um, you know maybe maybe you want to start with uh, something a little bit smaller um, I know a lot of people they started with consulting they might go on Upwork or something else like that or they might create a V card site or something and do some outreach and just you know be a one-man show to try to get some business going and then maybe let it naturally grow from there. You know, um, if you try to look at everybody else's agency and say, I need to like tick every single box of what they have. They have this nice website, they have this video, they have this, and I can't start without uh, those things. Uh, that's that's a little bit of uh, preparing to prepare, to prepare, to prepare. And you know, you're just never pulling the trigger, right? Um, so I think pull the trigger on the smallest minimum viable product of what you can do. And that can literally be just taking your Upwork profile and, and improving it and getting some clients and then billing them through your agency masthead. 
uh, uh, you know, well, I know you have to build them through Upwork, but, you know, giving them some itemization so they start getting used to your branding. So eventually you can maybe move them over to your agency site or something like that. But that's my that's my advice. You know, either you need to bite the bullet, set some hard goals and be unforgiving, you know, to the point where, like, you should be fearful if you're not going to hit your 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 goal for that week. And you should stay up all night like it was a college exam that you're going to get it done. And if you really don't feel like you have that in you, then you need to downsize your initial milestone goal to something smaller so that you could get a win underneath your belt. You need that win. All right. Okay, thanks. Um, if I can just chime in on that and kind of talk about my own experience as an SEO, you know, agency um, founder. But before that, I'd like to make a quick shout out to Mr. Ernie Martinez, who's in this call. Uh, he's a GDI client. Um, they run Eagle Point Resort over there in Batangas. So, pag pwede na mag-swimming, tsaka wala na ulan, punta lang kayong Eagle Point. Hi, Sir Ernie. Ayun. Anyway, um, yeah. Um, so, Kurt was asking, um, you know, what could help him keep motivated and stay consistent to, you know, to kind of pull together an agency and hopefully start something that's sustainable. Um, what worked for me would be a couple of things. Um, number one, and I know Sam does not approve of this, but he does not like measuring himself against other people. And um, I totally, super honestly admire people like that who, you know, measure themselves against themselves. Uh, and, you know, um, yeah, I think that's the best possible way you can go. But um, to me, it kind of feels like playing a racing game on time trial where there are no other cars on the track it just doesn't uh do it for me so what i did was to kind of check the landscape see who the other players are and kind of measure again you know myself against them so the first people you would see would be like the prominent guys uh the jason Asidras of the world the shansis of the world um gary Virai, like people i totally admire and respect in terms of doing business. Um, however, uh, admiration and respect does not mean I would not want to compete against the likes of them. So I think initially that's what motivated me um, to try and see if I can put together something that's hopefully comparable and competitive to what these guys are doing. So yeah, ako. So that's that was my first thing. And um, I think uh, it doesn't necessarily work for everyone, but as far as my personality type goes, I was raised to be kind of competitive. So yeah, uh, that was my first motivation. Uh, my, my first thing was I can't let these guys get too far ahead of me. So I have to, you know, kind of keep working, keep chipping away. I know this, uh, like some of these guys, like say Jason would be a lot, of, a lot more talented than me in SEO doesn't mean I can't out hustle him. Doesn't mean I can't outwork him. Like some of the most, um, you know, uh, most iconic athletes in the world are not necessarily the most talented. Like if you ask uh, Floyd Mayweather, he will talk a lot of smack, but he will be the first to say he just outworks everyone than out talenting them. Uh, I guess same thing with Kobe Bryant. And number two, um, the, the other thing that uh, keeps me motivated even at times when I kind of feel lazy or distracted or whatnot. Um, I kind of got this from reading about, you know, Michael Jordan. So the reason Michael Jordan became such a legendary trash talker, uh, aside from being, you know, great at basketball, is that um, he tends to, to say things to people like, um, I'm going to fuck you up, I'm going to drop 50 points on you or something like that at the start of the game. Um, the reason he says that it's not necessarily to kind of demoralize or show up the other guy. The reason he says that is um, if he doesn't drop 50 on this guy, then he's not going to be able to live with himself because, you know, trash talking is one thing, but if you can't back it up, you're, you're just going to end up as a clown. So, yeah, um, you can see me posting a lot of, you know, mo most of what, what I post on social media are jokes, but... Once in a while, I would post about a goal or something that I'm going to do. And, you know, I kind of back myself into a corner where I have no choice but to accomplish it 
because I already broadcast it to like a thousand people on my friends list. And if I don't get it done in a couple of years, uh, you guys will probably not remember it, but I wouldn't be able to live with, my, with myself talking all that crap and not being able to back it up. So yeah, um, like I said, I guess my personality type is a little bit more unique than most, but that's kind of what does it for me. And I know Sam disapproves, but I know <laughs> no, I think everyone should look. You're a very successful guy, and you know I think everybody has to. I mean, to that point, Kurt, uh, what I say and what Glenn says is just our, you know, advice and opinions. But you have to find what motivates you. Right. You know what motivates Glenn may not work for you, and what may motivates me now may may not work for you. You know, so keep looking for those answers. Keep asking those questions. But ultimately, like I always say, look at the metrics. Are you making progress? If you're not making progress, maybe you need to change the way that you're motivating yourself. Right. Uh, and John, I, I think we have a question from Manuel. Um, would you do the honors? Uh, yeah. Um, so just as a quick um, question, it's, about, it's a question about marketing technology and software as a service. So Sam, what would be the best starting point from zero dollars MRR to at least ten thousand dollars MRR I know this sounds broad but would love to know your thoughts yeah yeah you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna probably just ignore the ten thousand MRR and uh, you, what, what it sounds like you want to do is you're trying to get to um, some sort of sustainable level of revenue right to support the technology or, or recoup your investment at the marketing cost mm. so I, I've actually had a couple of consulting clients that are in the software space and and um, the ones that do well, kind of out of the gate, uh, they usually are in uh, like some sort of consulting capacity or in-house capacity, and they see a problem, right? They see like a really painful problem within uh, either their business or their client's business, and they say, you know, I'm going to solve this, right? And so they build something to solve that very, very painful problem, and that first user becomes that client, you know, and, and sometimes it doesn't even get to the point where they're thinking of it as software as a service. They're not even thinking about monetizing this. They're just happy that they've solved their problem and they continue to improve it and improve it to that. At some point they realize it is a product, right? Um, so, you know, if you're just thinking, hey, I want to get in MarTech SaaS and I'm creating the SaaS, you know, I think the, the first thing that you want to do is give that software to somebody to use. And if you have to charge them for it, it's going to kind of create a barrier. And if they're willing to pay for it, great. But, if, you know, even if they're not, you should still let um, sophisticated users use that software, help you refine that software. And the truth is that marketers talk, you know, actually all business people talk. Um, 50X Digital, for example, as an agency, we've never once marketed ourselves. As, as a company, we've never marketed ourselves. We've gotten, you know, two or three new clients per year just through networking and referral, just people who are recommending. We actually had, we lost one account and the manager that was our contact left that company, went to another company and rehired us at his new company, right? You know, so if you want to get to sustainable MRR, you need to have true loyal fans, true loyal users that can't live without your product. Um, then whether it's 10K or 100K, it, it's just a matter of time of how long it takes you to get there, right? Uh, you know, can I tell you all the tactile things that you could do? Yeah, you could do your competitors' keyword research. You could bid on those terms. Um, you could undercut their pricing. You could have a better sales team. You know, but those are all <laughs> uh, things that I think you obviously know, right? Um, that you need to go and execute on. And it's tough, especially if you're in a rich uh, Martech SaaS environment. It's very competitive. You know, the part of the problem of being in Martech SaaS is that it's built by marketers, and so everybody has good marketing for the most part. Um, you know, if you if you create SaaS in a different space that isn't marketing oriented, you'll probably uh, have less competition and might actually end up making more money in my opinion. But um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. All right. Um, Bench had a comment about, you know, measuring inches. I'm, I'm not sure about this one. But um, I guess just to kind of, uh, you know, add to what I just said, um, there is such a thing as setting impossible targets uh, that also applies to competition. So the reason I did not mention, um, you know, the likes of Bench and Sam, uh, you know, when I talked about the people I wanted to measure myself against is that when I saw Bench for the first time talking, um, I think I was just starting in SEO and I immediately knew that 
I'm never I could work my ass off and never be as good as that guy. Like um, I always tell my people here in the office, I could try all I want, but I'll never be you know as good as as like Sam in what he does. So uh, yeah, I think keep your targets reasonable. Um, when you try to motivate yourself by comparing yourself to other people, uh, do it, you know, in a realistic way. Um, it's like, like, uh, and I hate to use this analogy because Bench just talked about inches, but it's like cockfighting, <laughs> uh, which is totally legal in the Philippines. Um, okay. there's, there's such a thing as like, um, you know, there are different types of roosters, just like in boxing, there are different weight classes. Um, like Manny Pacquiao can be in his prime and, you know, train his ass off, but he's not going to beat a heavyweight, uh, in, at least not a credible one. In the same way in cockfighting, a six-month-old rooster um, is probably going to run away once a one-year-old rooster, you know, starts flapping its wings. It's just instinct. Uh, that's kind of what I felt when I, I saw Bench speak for the first time in a conference, I'm never going to be as good as that guy. So keep your targets reasonable. Anyway, moving on. So um, John, do we have, we have any other questions or can I keep going with my own? Uh, yeah, apparently most of the people um, here were really engrossed with uh, Sam's talk. That, you know, there, there weren't really much questions and we've addressed all of the ones that came in. All right, so I'll ask Sam another question, um, kind of springboarding uh, off of one point that he made earlier. So you mentioned that uh, there is no better um, kind of sales pitch to people, to people uh, for them to join your team than to kind of show them that you are growing. Um, so how do you kind of um, project into people's minds that you are experiencing growth without sounding like you're, you know, you're full of shit. It's <laughs> interesting. Um, well, I mean, first of all, uh, I think if it's, if it's real stuff, you're talking about real growth. I, I don't think people are going to think you're full of it. You know, uh, I, I think people will understand that, that you're just stating kind of the facts of your growth. But, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about company growth and I, I said, oh, we went from 80 million, you know, 8 million to 80 million, or we went to, you know, $50 million, you know, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't mean anything to them, right? Um, they've, they might have even come from a larger company, a billion dollar, you know, or multi-billion, hundred billion, whatever peso, you know, uh, company in the Philippines. They might be working, you know, coming from one of those. So at, at that point, you know, the, the overall growth of the company is less important and the growth of the people within the department is the most important. Um, you know, I think that uh, I think that uh, the best way to do that, and we did this a lot at Digital Room, and I did this a little bit um, at, at ZVenturesInkJets.com, is to have your managers and 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 your team members also interview um, the people who are coming in, right? And a lot of the, a lot of the people would say, "What do you want me to talk to this person about? Like, am I am I hiring them?" I'm like, "No, you're supposed to answer questions because." You know, you're you're going to be a potential colleague of theirs, and they might have questions about the environment, and be very, very honest. You know, um, and I think if you are, you got to work hard at it. Again, if it helps if you hire people that are friends, it it, it helps if people are actually friends, and you know that's your own personal prerogative if you want to make friends at work. But you know, I like having a workforce where everybody really enjoys spending time with each other, both inside and outside the office, and that shows. So when those people come and and, and they talk about, yeah, I, I you know. Like Carol does this for me a lot. I don't know if Carol's on. So Carol is um, my general manager of, of 50X Digital and kind of the heir apparent who's going to take over that company as I, uh, you know, I, I focus on some other things. I'm trying to see if she's on here. I see some of my employees on here, but I don't, I don't see Carol. I'm here, um, Sam. Oh, she's there. Okay. You know, so Carol will literally tell people, you know, I, Carol graduated from college. Uh, she worked for me at Digital Room. Uh, she worked there for, uh, 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 I think, four years or something. She went and got... Um, her MBA, she, she worked for an IALA group company, you know, and then she came back, she helped me build 50X Digital here in the Philippines and, and uh, she leads that operation. She doesn't have to like, and, and first of all, she doesn't come off ever as like talking, uh, talking uh, boastfully. She's a very humble person. So when she tells people, you know, that she's been 
uh, working with me and she's been working with the company from the very beginning and uh, you know she she shares her genuine story I think that's attractive um, to people that she's interviewing you know maybe it's better to ask my employees if they felt that way or not Carol <laughs> since some of them are on this call but um, <laughs> My answer is that, you know, it's not, it's less about Sam coming on or Glenn coming on and saying, hey, our company is growing like crazy. We're the best. And it's more about, you know, getting the team members to interview. And my team members, they know they all, they've all kind of, uh, if they've been with us for at least a year and a half or two, they've all had a chance to interview a new person coming in onto their team. Um, and, you know, uh, if they thought that person was really great, they'd try to do a great job of bringing them because they want good people on their team, right? So they are the best recruiters. Uh, and going back to referral programs, you know, Job Street costs an arm and a leg. Let's be honest. Give that to your employees. Focus on referral bonuses, right? That's way better investment, in my opinion, than paying Job Street. And if there's a Job Street person on here, please don't increase my prices. No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, just to add a little bit to that, um, we've been doing this thing for seven years now. Um, when I say this thing, uh, it's GDI, like the agency and we've been fortunate enough in the past couple of years to kind of expand into a couple of businesses um, real estate which we hope will turn into you know passive income down the line and then uh, our own web property which is you know which has not made a single peso yet but uh, it's getting there um the way you kind of project growth and i think it's something that sam touched on which is very important um Experiencing growth is almost, you know, um, sorry, projecting and showing people that you are growing is almost as important as experience, genuinely experiencing, it, you know, growth from a financial sense. Um, our former director of search marketing, Raymond, and, you know, a guy whose business instincts I, I really trust, um, he told me this thing, you know, this thing in one of our uh, dinners together. Uh, he said, um, and it, this is Tagalog, so I'll just translate it later for the you know benefit of Sam, but uh, it's best said in Tagalog. He said, he, he was just telling his brother, tignan mo yung si Glenn, puro kalokohan ng pinagpapopost sa Facebook, pero naniniwala yung mga tao sa kanya. So, pero, kasi ang tingin nila, namumunga talaga yung ginagawa niya. At pag namumunga yung puno, paliligiran yan ng mga tao. So just a rough translation, Sam. Um, he said basically half or most of what I post on Facebook is BS, but doesn't really matter because people um, see the projection of growth and people like to, you know, like feel good stories. They like uh, trees that kind of bear fruit and the tendency of people, you know, um, when they see fruit bearing trees is to kind of surround it and you know make it grow even more so I think uh, that's really a nice bit of wisdom com coming from him because um, the people who hear about your growth may not necessarily become your customers but when they you know when they when you establish a little bit of notoriety with them they kind of become your soft evangelists and sooner or later, these people will come into contact with people who will be able to bring, you know, tangible growth to your business. So let me give you an example. Um, just blogging or doing webinars like this, um, 40 or 80 of you guys out there, uh, out of the 40 or 80 of you guys out there, you may not become GDI customers down the line, but I guarantee you that maybe one of or two of you will leave you know, this call with such a good impression of me and Sam that later on you'll come into contact with someone who is, you know, uh, in a position to be our customer that might, you know, work out well for us. So in real life, this kind of translates into me doing this and then you um, you may be a, an SEO specialist or an SEO manager right now for a small company, but later on you find a better opportunity for a Philippine, you know, conglomerate, which is huge. And then when you need an agency, the first thing you think of would be GDI because it's kind of burned in your mind. Uh, a lot of people kind of asked me how we ended up, you know, working with the likes of uh, Metro Pacific, with the JG Summit or, you know, the Robinsons Group or even ABS-CBN. I would say that's less about doing SEO and that's more about 
um, you know, establishing relationships and kind of being top of mind uh, and being able to project growth to people. Because some of the people I knew from years ago who were working as rank and file employees, these, are, these people are not staying that way forever. They, they have their own growth paths. So once they start growing their careers and start getting into these, these big companies, once they feel the need to kind of source some work to agencies, the first thing that comes to mind would be their relationship with me and, you know, uh, the impression I left them. So it's super important to kind of project growth because it not only feeds into your current value and it not only feeds kind of your ego, but in reality, uh, it influences other people and down the line that might be very lucrative for you. So, yeah. Any other questions, John? Yeah, actually, we got a follow-up question from Manel earlier about the topic on smart access. Um, okay. For Sam, um, so what would be the most profitable skill to focus on to get us to at least $20,000 um, MRR? What marketing channel would have the most impactful benefits to business owners? Yeah, I mean, if, I'm, um, if you're going to put a uh, kind of peg me to the wall and, and make me answer that question, you know, if it was me, I would do content, right? Um, because content is so useful in multiple places. Once one thing you could one thing you could do is you could take a piece of of, of educational content about um, the specific area of marketing that you work in and how your product provides benefits and how it creates a strategic advantage, right? So you create you might create a longer white paper, then you might turn that into a slide share, and you might turn that into a bunch of tweets and a bunch of posts, and um, you know continu continually you know put that content out there because people are searching for it. You know they're on YouTube trying to learn. Um, but the second part of that is when you actually get a customer, um, that content also becomes useful in onboarding them. That becomes useful in pitching them and, and showing them what you're able to do, right? So, you know, um, we work with some SaaS clients. You know, if we have no content, the team doesn't know what to do, right? We don't have content to promote. Uh, we can't really do cold outreach with nothing to show people, you know. So I would say try to focus on a high quality piece of content. And when I mean high quality, uh, don't copy what other people have out there. You know, you could always do that later if you want to get some additional content. But if it's going to be your starting point, try to bring something to the table that people aren't aware of, something that's really rarely known, and something that you know factually is going to help people improve their business. All right. So um, we'll move on to the second to the last question. So while Sam is answering this, if you, um, I know a lot of you like to ask questions when, you know, when we're about to close, uh, when there's more of a sense of urgency. So uh, yeah, I'll ask Sam one question and then we'll answer maybe a couple more from you guys if you know, uh, you, if you have any other, if you, if you don't, uh, I'll ask uh, you know, another question and then we'll wrap up. So uh, Sam, what would you give you know, people who want to do business or are already in business um, you know, what advice would you give them during this pandemic? Hmm. Yeah, this is so, you know, I'm going to answer more specifically to people who are suffering in this pandemic, right? Because I have a business that's doubled, but I also have a business that's gone down by half, right? And uh, it's an interesting opportunity. One thing we did is we didn't lay anybody off. So we had a lot of excess labor. Um, so we went back to kind of our backlog of things that we wanted to do that it never seemed, you know, perhaps valuable enough uh, and probably maybe didn't even seem that valuable, you know, uh, at all. Uh, and we tackled those projects, whether it's rearranging the warehouse, taking a, a fresh inventory count, you know, uh, uh, writing documentation, right, uh, rewriting uh, quoting templates or, 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 or customer onboarding files and stuff like that. Things that are uh, hard to do when you're busy with customers um, and a lot easier to do once you have a little bit of downtime, right? So, you know, um, whether, you know, you, I would say go back and look at the points where you've had uh, a bit of pain within your sales or marketing funnel and figure out how you can optimize that flow. Go back into your operations and look at what repetitive tasks that you have, try to create processes and automation in those space. It's really the excuse that people have when they don't improve their systems they're all, you know, with automation or processes is like, I'm just too busy. I don't have time to do that. Well, guess what? You've been given a nice gift of time here and uh, it's gonna be painful for some people as revenue is low. 
um, but this is an opportunity to improve, right? And I, I said it, um, you know, I said it earlier in my presentation, sometimes it's not about outrunning your competitors. It's not about beating them. It's about out surviving them, right? And, um, you know, a lot of different industries right now are suffering. We are seeing a lot of business closures, unfortunately. And I think it's really important to uh, uh, keep yourself productive and try to survive this. Keep yourself lean. You know, sometimes that's going to be painful. Sometimes you will have to let people go. Sometimes you will have to do furloughs, right? But try to figure out how you're going to survive and come out of this thing stronger, you know, with better content, with better processes, with better sales, better marketing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, additionally, you know, I think that there are interesting pivots here. Right. So if you see an opportunity or an area of your business that is still doing well, maybe you invest more heavily in that area of your business. Right. That may turn out to become, um, you know, something that helps you uh, helps buoy the entire organization through this tough time. right here. Yeah, um, I just want to add something to that, um, you know, as an entrepreneur who is managing a team, you know, part of my uh, about a third of my team is in the office, but like most of you guys out there, the rest of my team is working from home. Um, this pandemic has been a tremendous learning experience, obviously for everyone, but especially for an agency like us who have to stay cohesive and you know productive uh, because um, we're one of the few ones who were not as affected as others when it comes to maintaining clients and uh, preserving our cash flow. But that does not mean we can kind of relax and, you know, take off our foot off the gas. Uh, the most important thing during this pandemic is to demonstrate to your employees and to your clients that your business is staying relevant. And what I mean by that is that um, it has to show its value. Like your business has to prove whether it's marketing or it's sales, it's retail, it has to prove itself to be still useful to people despite everything that's going on. And secondly, it has to prove itself worthwhile for your own employees, for them to stay motivated and to, you know, uh, to continue chipping away at the work that you give them. Um, it's so easy to lose sight of what matters in your career if you've been locked down from, you know, within your house for the past, for the, you know, past three months, it's easy to see every day as a copy of a copy of a copy and, you know, different day, same shit. But in reality, um, what you do as an employee is something that, uh, in a, in, you know, it, that ultimately impacts someone's business. And if you're not able to pull yourself together motivation wise and, you know, production wise, then that business is going to suffer. And if that business suffers and eventually closes, it starts off a chain reaction uh, of other closures. So um, globally, the business community is, uh, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but we're all in this together. So one guy's failure eventually uh, leads to an entire organization's failure. And if one organization fails, uh, a lot of other organizations are going to start feeling that kind of failure. So if you can, you know, find it in you to stay motivated, stay productive during the pandemic. That's kind of the best thing that you can do. So yeah, um, are there any other questions, John, or should I proceed to my last question? Uh, yeah, one from Benj Ariola. Um, and I'm actually kind of um, happy that you ended up talking about motivations because that's exactly what Benj's question was about. So just to read this question, um, uh, for 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 pretty down days where a lot of things failed to, uh, failed too many tasks are past due, money is not coming in, just everything is going bad. How do you get pumped up to get working again, Sam? Mm. Uh, so for me, I, I I just disconnect. You know, I um I don't do well under that type of uh, kind of negativity. Like it, I get my anxiety will really kick up and stuff. So I might spend time with my family. I might play with my daughter. Um, I might be in my garden. Um, some of you guys who follow me on Facebook know that I like my garden quite a bit. Um, but do something, you know, um, where, where you could kind of take your mind off things. Uh, I, you know, I, I find generally, and this is personal, so I don't know if it's the same with other people, that I could go to, I, I could like come home from work and feel like, oh my God, 
we're going to fail. We're going to go bankrupt. Everything, the world is ending, right? You know, you get those days where you're just like, oh my goodness. And, uh, you know, your creative imagination starts spiraling. Your family's on the street, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, but the next day, you know, after a good night's sleep, you know, you wake up, you kind of come back to reality and you're like, you know what? No, it's not that bad. I just need to get back up and, and fix the problems. And, you know, eventually, uh, you know, you, you'll chip away at those problems, you know, the next day and the next day and you'll get caught up. And if you don't, well, I think that just goes back to sometimes you fail, you know, and uh, sometimes it's good just to let things go and, and start over fresh with something else. Um, there's there's a, a point at which throwing good money after bad or, or you know, investing into something does because you have sunk costs, right? I, I've heard people say, I can't let this fail. I put five years of my life into this. And I'm like, do you want to put 10? You know, like it's, it's you got to be careful about, um, you know, not like learning to cut your costs at some point. But usually what happens is the next day you come out fresh and you start making progress again and kind of your attitude and your feelings will turn around in, in, in my opinion, yeah. So Ben, let me reflect that question back to you. Um, how do you get pumped up when, you know, you've been doing SEO for so long, how do you stay excited with our work? <laughs> Good question. I'm just pretending. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just pre- no. There's sometimes when I say I'm just pretending to enjoy everything. Now I'm really enjoying. <laughs> um, um, similar to Sam, sometimes just sleep, wake up the next day, and I'm good again. Uh, I'm a person where I have lots of hobbies. I have lots of things to do, so um, I could just go to one thing and then just go back to work, and then I'm I'm good to go. Usually it comes after sleep which I, I, I don't spend too much. I think I average only four to five hours of sleep, which is not healthy, but I, I've been doing that since the late 90s, <laughs> up to today. Uh, so after I sleep, wake up, everything's fresh again. And then just like what Sam said, chip away. Mm-hmm. Just one small thing at a time. Uh, when I put it down in the list and start prioritizing, seeing what's most important, what's least important, and start chipping away with the with the most important and also also categorizing it from level of difficulty. Um, things that you could uh, finish quickly um, uh, also factors in so that you could take it off your list of things to worry about. Yeah, I agree with both of you guys. Um, I think Sam and I are fortunate that we have, you know, our kids are still relatively young. And it's just so refreshing to, you know, interact with children, kind of forget about, you know, business for a while, uh, spend time with your loved ones, uh, your your spouse, um, that kind of thing always helps. Not all the time, though. Um, sometimes uh, as business people and as professionals, uh, business kind of uh, spills over into our personal lives. I mean, my wife, May, and I uh, could be spending time and then we could just unconsciously start talking about business because she handles finance here in GDI. So uh, at that point, we kind of catch ourselves and, uh, you know, remind each other that we're not here to talk about business. We have all the time in the world to talk about that in the office. So you kind of catch yourself and kind of uh, continue with your detox that usually helps. Um, uh, Like Sir Bench said, uh, hobbies help. Uh, personally, uh, I have I also have anxiety. It kind of ties into my vertigo. So when you know I start feeling vertigo, all those weird thoughts of um, you know uh, are you know start flooding into my head. Like, do I have heart disease? Do am I having a stroke or some shit like that? And you know what? What I do? Uh, the best thing to do at that point would be to play some Mario Kart. Like specifically that game Mario Kart because it's cute it's colorful it's exciting um and it's you know it's relaxing but at the same time you have to uh kind of maintain a level of concentration to do well in that game and even 30 minutes of you know distraction away from business thoughts i found through experience helps a lot and you know um after i play Mario Kart that kind of uh, takes away the vertigo and you kind of uh, deduce to yourself that 
it's not heart disease. It's you're not you're not close to a stroke. It's just anxiety setting in. And if you distract yourself long enough, you'll figure out uh, there's nothing really wrong with you. So that's kind of what does uh, what does it for me. Um, kind of my last resort when I'm not pumped up or motivated would be to go back to the Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant school of thought, wherein you try to um, remember every person who has slighted you, insulted your work, or, you know, belittled you in the past. Um, that's kind of the ultimate, you know, uh, pill. Don't use it too often because, you know, just like any drug, it kind of damages you in the long term. But just use it to light a fire under you, keep you going, give you that initial push, and then move on from there. So, yeah. Uh, last question, Sam. Um, what, what is your end game as a businessman? I know we're all in business to kind of make money. Uh, you know, that's the point of business, to earn some profits. But you as a person, uh, why did you get in business and what's your uh, ultimate goal in doing this? Yeah, why did I get into business? Ego, uh, money, you know, I think, I, I think my uh, reasons to getting into it were not necessarily uh, the most wholesome or, or, or admirable. I just wanted to make a lot of money and, you know, um, you know, I thought I could conquer the world. Right. Um, but as you get older, your, your, your thoughts change on this quite a bit. Um, you know, I've made okay money, you know, um, I, I don't think that my family has to worry about money. Um, so it, it became less of a motivation for me. Like once you get to a certain point, you realize that, I guess it depends on the type of person you are, right? Like if you really, really like expensive things, then, you know, there's no amount of money that's going to really um, fulfill that. So you're going to have to keep working and working and working. And then my family, we're not, we're just not that way, I would say. So I think I had to rethink that question quite a bit. Um, it's one of the reasons that I've pared down and I've literally stepped away from my, a lot of my business investments, right? Where um, I own a meaningful share of a lot of companies, but I have decided consciously that I don't want to get involved with those businesses. I'm going to let them run. I'm going to let the teams run them and I'm going to let my partners run them. You know, I, I hope someday that's going to be true with my Philippines company that, you know, my, my partner, Carol, will be running uh, that entire organization. And I really want to focus on um, what I want to do, you know. And for me, I think it's, again, about building an organization. Um, I'm like very obsessed with this idea of, of understanding how to create the most productive and fun workplace, right? Like people come and uh, they spend 60% of their waking hours, maybe 70% of their waking hours on a weekday with you, working with you, right? And if that's torture, oh man, you got to really question of what you're doing on this earth, right? If you're creating a torture chamber instead of like an enjoyable work environment. And that's, I, I think I'm, I'm, that's hyperbole, right? You know, uh, that is a torture chamber. Um, but, you know, really, um, I think that our generation, specifically these younger entrepreneurs, um, we're not coming out of, well, hopefully we're not coming out of a world war. <laughs> um, who knows? Uh, fingers crossed. But, you know, we're not like our previous generations. My parents' generations, they immigrated. They, my dad was born during the Korean War. Um, you know, they emigrated to the United States in the 70s and, and, and they came with a few bucks in their pocket and they, they had to do whatever they needed to do to survive. And you know, they they just thought of work as like, hey, you have to do that. You have to go and do that, right? But our generation doesn't necessarily think that way. Our generation thinks, wait, do I need to be unhappy at work? Or is just, is, does it have to be this grueling, right? This is a question we ask ourselves. And as a business owner, I'm going to tell you that there are absolutely repetitive things within a job environment. There are things that maybe are less fun. There are a lot of things that I have to do, like sending invoices and billing and stuff like that, that are just, I'm not fun. It's not fun. Honestly, it's not. I have to do paperwork, you know? Um, so I, I understand that that's really an aspect of the job that, you know, will probably diminish with, diminish with automation, but realistically is not going away, right? Um, but on the other side of that, how do you make uh, a company have really and really interesting, exciting work culture, you know? I think we were all inspired when we saw Google into early, you know, like early teens or the late 2000s and you're like, oh, they're so cool. And, and then like, you know, 20 years later, like any other company, you're kind of wondering like, hey, how evil are these guys, right? Um, as a big company. They're probably listening to this conversation on Google Hangouts right now, right? Um, so, you know, I think that's what I really want to do. I, I, I want to have a company that, you know, I don't want it to get too big 
um, where it's all profit driven or investor driven. You know, I've been down that road. Um, I want, I want it to grow naturally. I want to create opportunity and growth. Um, you know, I like, I've, I've read a lot of, uh, studies and stuff on like company, uh, sorry, employee owned businesses, uh, employee owned corporations and stuff like that. So I don't know, uh, how to make that really work, especially if, you know, us as investors are putting all the money in, like, when do we get our money back and how does that become, you know, I think, Glenn, you're playing around with a lot of these ideas in a very capitalistic, productive way, right? How do we transform the way that we think about corporations and work to be both profitable and competitive, but also enriching to the employees, both financially and personally? Right. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, for me, what got me started down this path is uh, the same things that got you started on it. Uh, money, ego. When you're young, um, it's okay. It's even ad admirable to, you know, kind of dream like that. Uh, because if you're not doing that, then what the hell are you really doing with your career uh, if you're not dreaming big? But after you reach a certain threshold of, you know, financial success or um, notoriety, um, you kind of see the world in, you know, in a slower pace, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, you kind of see people uh, after, you know, after leading a certain number of people, you kind of uh, kind of start classifying people according to their motivations, what makes them think and whatnot. And what I found throughout enti this entire process is that uh, a study that I read from a few years back, a few years back is actually true, wherein it said that if you're earning about, you know, 500,000, uh, sorry, $5,000 uh, in savings per month, you probably have 90% of what you want and need in this life. And everything else just, you know, um, it's just extra. And everything else just provides you just a little bit of a dopamine boost in your brain, but not that much. It becomes diminishing returns after that point. And I think that's true. Like, if you have 250,000 pesos worth of savings per month, You'll have your own house. You'll have your own car. You'll probably not be too worried about money, um, you know, like your basic needs. And um, the question you have to ask yourself after that point is, what else is there? Like, for me personally, uh, I answered that question, uh, the question of what else is there by telling myself it's, you know, well, luxury cars are there. Real estate is there. Um, more popularity is there. And that's all well and good. Uh, those are things that, you know, that um, motivate me. Uh, I still want to own a Porsche by, you know, before 40, because in the Philippines, they say uh, only DOMs or dirty old men own sports cars. So before 40, I have to get one. So I, I'm the, you know, I'm the exception, not the DOM, but owns a sports car. But, you know, those are like the pettier of my goals. Um, uh, at this point, as a human being, um, kind of what I wanted want to do as a businessman is to help other people achieve their goals. Like, for example, the Carlos of the world or the Charleses of the world. Um, like, they probably, uh, when you do the math, um, the, the odds are stacked against the Filipino employee. Like, if you just, uh, if you're just aiming to buy a house for something like 4 million, 5 million pesos, Guess what? If you do the math on that one, you're probably going to be working for that thing for the next 20 years. And I, I, I just don't know if it's worth that, if it's worth spending anyone's life, um, you know, toiling away for 100 square meters of land with a small house that you can call, call your own. If you're lucky, you will be able to accomplish that. But we're headed towards a future wherein most Filipinos will be renters. And uh, it's just hard for me to, to kind of accept that because our parents and our grandparents own land and uh, our generation does not. But uh, as an economy develops, that, that, kind, that kind of becomes the pattern. So in my own small way, you kind of want to break away from that. And I think with an, enough will and financial know-how, you can figure out ways to help your employees kind of um, achieve those things. In a, in a manner wherein they don't have to burn their lives, uh, you know, working for something like that. So, yeah, uh, personally for me, uh, it's all about that. It's all about uh, helping people gain equity in my 
own domain in in our own organization helping them achieve their goals um which they might not achieve uh somewhere else and um kind of a, in a bigger sense uh start a different and better working culture in the philippines we're in um you know we always complain as businessmen that um, the laws in the Philippines, the labor laws, are so biased towards the employees. But when you think about it, uh, the Filipino business community kind of brought it to themselves by being so unfair and so tyrannical with their employees for the past few decades that uh, the politics and the laws kind of had to adjust to that. But what about us who are doing business ethically here in the Philippines? We kind of fall victim with those blanket policies that are biased against us. So. Um, I guess for me, in a bigger sense, uh, in my own way, I want to start a better business, uh, you know, uh, culture in, here in the Philippines. And I may not change it uh, in this lifetime, but if I contribute to a bigger whole of, you know, more forward thinking employers, then I probably did my part in this lifetime. So, yeah, uh, that's kind of where I, I am as a business person. So, um Sam, thank you so much for joining us in this call. As usual, it's uh, an honor and you know a pleasure to exchange ideas with you. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Maybe talk about 50x or whatever before we wrap, we end the program. Uh, no, thank you for having me. Um, you know, so it was good. I, I miss you guys. I haven't made my you know, semi-annual uh, Philippines trip to have a beer with you guys. So it's, it's good to catch up this way. Probably should have had a beer while we were doing this uh, yeah. in lieu of that. Um, and, and I'll just say that any of you guys, you know, if you didn't have a, a if you didn't really uh, have the question, but later it comes to you, you know, feel free to reach out to the people, uh, whether it's Benj or Glenn or myself, you know, um, part of being an entrepreneur is actually having a lot of mentors and, Glenn is very generous with his time. You know, Benj has uh, driven hours to meet up and has answered questions uh, tirelessly uh, for no money at all um, <laughs> and volunteered his time to so many people in the community. So so please, please, please uh, don't be shy to reach out. If you're starting a journey to be an entrepreneur, um, you know, get all the help that you can that's free. There's no reason not to. And, uh, and these guys are great resources. So uh, thank you, Glenn. All right. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, everyone else who joined us, thank you so much. Sir Benj, Sir Ernie, uh, my team, Sam's team, uh, all of you guys. Thank you so much. We're going to talk about PPC next week with Mr. Jun Barangan and uh, Fred Flores. So, yeah, uh, stay tuned for that one, and we'll see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Glenn. Thank, thank you, Sam. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Take care. Stay safe.